We're talking about Thanksgiving. It's one of the greatest times of the year, but don't lose your your love for Jesus that you're shown because we're going to conclude this this day by just thanking God for what He's done and what He's yet to do and what, what He's doing in our midst. Thanksgiving. Because Thanksgiving is more than a, it's more than a season. I mean, yeah, you have me, you, you always get nervous when you're sitting around a Thanksgiving dinner and they're like, okay, I want, we're not going to eat until everybody says something they're thankful for. Has anyone ever, ever had that happen? And so I'd be like, okay, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the house. And then somebody said, I'm thankful for the house. I'm like, darn, I got to figure something else out. Uh, I'm thankful for, you know, the weather. And then somebody said, I'm thankful for the weather. It's like, oh, man. So by the time they get to me, I'm like, I'm thankful for what everybody else said they're thankful about. But the older I get, the more thankful I get. Because the more I see what God has done in my life and, and what he's done in our life and, and as our church life and, and, and all those kind of things. And um, so we're talking about Thanksgiving. And, and I remember a couple of years ago, this is, I'm so glad this season of life is over, but when COVID was going on, it was just nuts. Something that my wife's family does is we go to Missouri, a bunch of the extended family, because we, we just had a family member who said, you know what? I'm tired of traveling, you know, and we're all just going to somebody's house every year. Does anybody have families like that? One year you go to somebody's house, another year. And so what they just said, say, listen, we will make the Thanksgiving dinner, the Thanksgiving turkey and the potatoes, and everybody just brings a side item. And we do that every year. It takes the pressure off, but when COVID happened, and we, we weren't able to do that. So what we started doing as an extended family is every week we would do a Zoom call. And the whole family would do a family devotion. It was really cool. I mean, there'd be about 30 of us. And, but one year it was Thanksgiving. So we did a Thanksgiving Zoom call where some of us had food. And they just, of course, then all through the Zoom thing, everybody started sharing. And I was the one guy who didn't get to share. And I was like, man, the one year and I didn't get to do it. And so I was like, I'm not going to let this pass again. And so I came up with a list of seven things that I'm thankful for. And every year I go through this list. And it reminds me of the goodness of God. And maybe you need to do that. Maybe, maybe you're in here this room and maybe you're a mom and you're like, okay, or, or dad. It kind of reminds me of a video I saw, like husbands versus wives on Thanksgiving. And it showed a clip of all the women in the kitchen and there's things flying around all over the place. And we got to get it right. The house has got to be right. Everything's got to be right. And then it shows these two husbands. And they're standing by one of those fryers, and then there's turkey. And they're like, what time is it? Oh, we still got time. And the guys are just staring. And they go back to the women's kitchen, and it's chaos. And these guys have this, you know, how many people fry their turkeys? You know, the guys are just excited about frying the turkey and hoping they don't blow the place up, you know. I keep telling my wife every year, I want to get one of those. She goes, there is no way I'm going to trust you with that. So maybe maybe you're in here and, and and it's just your mind's chaotic. You're trying to think. There's travel things and 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 maybe it's just it's just nuts for you. Maybe you know you hear this this, this poem and you think about it. It's just encouraging. And the poem says, "May your stuffing be tasty. May your turkey be plump. May your mashed potatoes and gravy never have a lump. May your yams be delicious. And may your pies take the prize. And may your Thanksgiving dinner." Stay off your thighs. <laughs> Thanksgiving's a time to give thanks. It's a time to give praise. But Thanksgiving is more than a day. It's a lifestyle. That's why that message in tongues about continuing to pray, continuing to praise, when we set in our hearts as churches and peoples and families that Thanksgiving is your lifestyle. When you give thanks in the good times and in the bad times and in the in-between times, that, friends, is what makes a difference in your life and in everybody's life around you. First Thessalonians chapter 5:18 is my passage where I'm going to preach on. And in scripture, this is talked about give to have a lifestyle of, of thanks. It says, in everything. Everybody say everything. In everything. Say that again. Does it say in some of the things? Does it say in just what you want? It says, in everything, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for you to give thanks in all situations. 
in every day. It is a lifestyle and a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Thanks living is what it's called. So I'm going to go through my list and I'm going to share. And this is what I did. And I, I think about this every year. And it's seven reasons for Thanksgiving. Why am I thankful? Pastor Dan, what makes you so thankful? And I want to encourage you to kind of hold these to your heart. The first reason I am thankful is I am thankful because God loves me. Number one reason, God loves me. Hang on, there we go. God loves me. John 3.16, people who aren't even saved can mention this passage to you. You've seen it at football games. It's John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, his one and only son, that whoever believes, everybody say whoever, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have ever eternal life. God loves me. Even when I don't love myself. And not only does God love me, he loves everybody in this room. No matter who you are. No matter what you've done. No matter your background, because God knows your background, but he also knows your future. He loves us. That's what scripture says. The ways that he loves us is he loves us lavishly. Does anybody know what lavishly is? It means impressive. It means beyond riches. His love is immeasurable. It's a lavish love. He, there, even when we don't need it, he pours it down. First John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great the love the Father has it lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. Everybody in this room, you are children of God. And he loves you lavishly. There's no measurement of how much he loves everybody. That's why he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, he'll be saved. Maybe you're in this room and you've never done that. Maybe you're in this room and you've lost track of who Jesus is and you've fallen away. I'm, uh, I'm going to tell you today that even though we get cold and we fall away, God loves us. He doesn't love us less. He doesn't say, oh, that guy blew it. I don't love him as much. His love never changes. He loves us lavishly. Not only that, his love never ceases. You know what that means? His love never stops. It keeps going. It's immeasurable. He doesn't just love us. His love never ceases, but then he loves us unconditionally. You may be in this room, and you may be a drug addict. You may be in this room and you may be an alcoholic. You may be in this room and you could be a pornographer. But I'll tell you this, no matter how many times you've sinned against him, he still loves you unconditionally. You may be somebody who's went to church here for 40 years or 50, and maybe you're afraid in a minute, but your love's gone cold. And I'm here to tell you his love never goes cold. He loves the religious as much as he loves the people who are separated from him. His love is unconditional, and it's, it's, it keeps going. Not only that, he loves us sacrificially. True love is when you sacrifice, and God set the ultimate example when he sent his son for you. When his son took stripes on his back and hung on a cross to die, but thank God he rose three days later. But true love, and that's how much he loves, is there's a sacrificial love. And that's how much that God loves everybody in this room. Not only does he love us sacrificially, he loves us faithfully. You know what blew my mind when I got saved? God loved me faithfully even before I knew who he was. And for some of you, it, you're like, well, that's common sense. Some of us who weren't raised in church, we didn't understand that. I was like, you're and I was like, you're telling me that he loved me and I never knew him? And that's how much God loves you, friend. He loves you so much that even before the day that you knew him or said his name, he knew your name. Psalm 139 says that every day is ordained in his book. Before the day you even nerd, nerd, knew the name Jesus, he still loves us. Not only does he love us faithfully, he loves us calmly. You know, this is me getting on a soapbox. Okay? 
we live in a culture now where people, they say that statistically showing that less and less people are calling themselves Christ followers. I don't think it's a coincidence that less people say that, but things like anxiety, depression, and all those things are on the rise. Why is it on the rise? Because you, it, that's how it goes. When you start separating yourself from the peace of God, that's where anxiety and, and, and anger and depression, that's where it all sinks in. When you start to separate yourself from church and God's house, and then you wonder why those things are going up, it's no coincidence, friend. His love is peaceful. Scripture tells us, cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Where so many people are struggling is they, ca- they, don't, they don't keep track of that and they hold it all in or they go to the, right, the wrong source. And I'm telling you today, go to the right source. His love is calming and his love is peaceful. I'm not going to share stories, but I, in, in my life, what God taught me when I was young, I can't believe I'm at that point now where I'm saying when I was young, uh, hopefully there's people say, you're still young. But but I learned when I enter the presence of God and His love saturates my heart, there's a peace that comes with it. A peace that goes up beyond understanding. A lot of times we use that when it's funerals and all that. It's everyday life. There is a peace that comes from the love of God. When you're struggling, you count and you draw into the love of God. And when you learn to do that, friends, It changes your life. And lastly is this. His love is inseparable. Scripture says nothing can separate us from the love of God. I am so thankful, church, and I hope this is exciting you. I am so thankful that God loves me. And I am so thankful that God loves everybody in this room. First thing, God loves me. Second thing is this. I'm thankful because my sins are forgiven. Scripture says he throws our sins in as far as the east is from the west. I am so glad that even though the world may bring up things that I've done, I'm so glad that when my sins are forgiven, he remembers my sins no more. November is a big month for me. It was two weeks ago that, 30 years ago, two weeks ago, that I gave my life to Jesus. It was November 7, 1993, in that room back here. So whenever I go back in that room, it means something to me. Because I knew this is where it happened. Every, every time I go back there, it's like, this is where it happened. I'm thankful that on that day, my sins were gone, and I was a new person. I'm thankful that I don't have to live my life bound by my sin. And I'm thankful because God loves me. And God loves and God loves me. I'm thankful that my sins are forgiven. And maybe you're in this room and you've lost track of that. You've been saved for how many years? And and now it's just now it's just something that's there. Never, ever, ever, ever lose track and forget that your sins are forgiven. Because when you remember that your sins are forgiven, you don't look at people on their sins because you're just as guilty as they were or are. But when you remember that your sins are forgiven, friends, that's when true change happens. Thirdly, I have, I'm have i thankful because I have the promise of abundant life. And, and, and the world is different because oftentimes the world is measured by the abundance that you have. It's, a, you're, it's measured by how you own, what you own. And that's why some people, they compare. I wish my bank account was as big as theirs. I wish my car was as big as theirs. I wish my house was as big as theirs. I wish all these things were happening as measured by abundance. I am here to tell you that your life is not measured by the abundance of what you have. You, because everybody, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you have an abundant life when you follow Jesus. Why have the abundance of things of this world when you have the abundant life that only Jesus provides? Scripture says in John 10.10, For the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come, though that they may have life and may have it in full. That means in abundance. Your abundant life is more than enough. You know something which is which blew blew me away because when I was younger, I was, I mean it was you know you got to have the best this, you got to have the best this, 
And I realized some of the happiest people that I ever met in my life were the ones who didn't have much. When their priorities were in order, there was a joy, friends. When you have that abundant life that's found in Jesus, you have more than enough. And people have heard me share this, and that's why I get so confused about Christians who all they do is complain. If we have an abundant life in Jesus, then we have all the joy we need. I am, I am thankful that I have an abundant life in Jesus. And maybe you're in this room, and maybe you need to recalibrate that thought. So many people, they lose their families, and they lose their life. There's ministers who lose their, their ministry because it's just never enough. Was, this, wasn't in, this wasn't in my notes, but I feel led to share this. I remember when I was going to school, and one of the classes that I take was Pastor's Life and Ministry. He had all, the, all of us students there, and he had us all share our life stories and, and all of that, and, you know, just, you know, just, you know, just to get to know the class better. And then he was like, okay, anybody have any questions? And so me, I raised my hand. And I was like, uh, he's like, yeah. I said, well, you heard all about us. What do you like to do? And uh, he starts crying. And he goes, nothing. Of course, then my friend elbows me and says, way to go, Dan. Usually takes you a month to make a teacher cry. And you did it in the first day, you know. But then he shared a story about how he's pastoring a, life, a large church and it was never much. He always needed another family, more people. And then one day, a deacon, mem a board member, came into his church and said, "If you don't take, you're taking your son on a fishing trip next week. And if you don't, you're fired." See, a lot of people might think that's mean, but the pastor was like, "What do you mean? We got this meeting. We got it. We got to grow this church. We got. We got to have more." And the board member said, "Your son came to me." with a fishing pole that you bought him last year for Christmas, and it's still in the wrapping paper. And he said, you're always too busy to take him fishing. And the pastor said, I've lost track of the abundant life I have and what, and what God's given me, and I got consumed with things. And let this be a warning, because maybe there's people in this room, and you're letting the thing of this world consume your time, consuming, consuming what you have. It's always more. And there comes a time where you have to say, I have enough. I have an abundant life. One thing that I learned to say when I was younger was, God, you never have to do anything else for me because by forgiving me, you've done more than enough. And this is what blows me away. I've told them, you don't have to do that anymore. You've done this. But God still chooses to do it. Abundant life. Not measured by your bank account or your possessions. And my wife would always say, it doesn't matter because you never see a hearse. You know, uh, I forgot to say, I'm going to blow it. Like, I've never seen a hearse in heaven or something. I don't remember what it was. About. But you, some people, you know what I'm trying to say, okay? We're going to leave it. But there's an abundant life that we're never going to lose. I'm thankful for abundant life. Be, be, be thankful for your abundant life. Everybody still with me? Next is this. I'm thankful that my future is secure. Hallelujah. When I gave my life to Jesus, my future became secure. So many people wonder, okay, what, what's next for me? What's next for me? I know no matter where the journey leads me, my, uh, my, my life is in God's hands. Psalm chapter 31, verse 14 says this, But I trust in you, Lord, and say, you're my God. My times are, my times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. One thing I've learned, church, is there's a peace that comes when you place your life in his hands. Anybody a planner? I drive people nuts because I'm a planner. And if, if I don't kind of have things set, I stress. So if, if there's ever an event that I'm doing, you're going to see me stressed because I'm like, okay, I think I get everything done. I hope things don't mess up. I'm a planner. I drive people nuts because I'm a planner. I used to be the one Thanksgiving, like, okay, what are we going to do for Christmas? And they're like, can we at least eat a turkey first? And one, to one thing that I had to learn, 
because I even remember I went into ministry. I was like, okay, uh, I'm never going to work with kids. Seriously. I'm never going to work with teenagers. Because I wasn't, when I was a kid or teenager, I didn't go to church. And so I had it set. I had it all planned out. I'm going to go to school. And then, you know, I'm going to be a youth pastor for like a year. And then I'm going to become an executive pastor, whatever those are. And I'm going to be a pastor. And I'm going to do all this. And I remember I, uh, I, was, uh, I was in a class. And I don't know if anybody remembers Dr. Best, Pearl Best. And I took his class. I audited it. That means I didn't have to do homework. But I just wanted to learn. I didn't get a grade in class either. But he did. He had us all as a class go around. It was like, tell us your plan. Out, you know, we're all just. And he looks at the class and said, "You guys have great plans." And he said, "And you're all going to fail." And I said, "I'm not going to fail. I audited this class." <laughs> but he said, "One thing. I, if there's one thing I could teach you is this: it's not your plan. It's God's. When you place your life in God's hands." He's never going to lead you astray, and he's going to take care of you. I remember I still had to learn that. I remember um, years ago when I first came here, 2003, and Brother Dorsey was like, you know, he's like, this is what I want you to do. And he goes, now, I don't want you working with the kids, and I don't want you working with the teenagers. And I'm like, hey, fine. Three, a month later, I'm working in children's church. And it was temporary until he found somebody else, and that was like six years. And then youth pastor, you know, and, and God's had us there. But something I've learned is you place your life in hands. You know what I'm thankful? And this may not mean any, but anything to anybody else, but this is my Thanksgiving list, and I'm going to share it with you. 28 years ago in November, I preached my first message. It was at a little little church in Romance, Arkansas. I was thinking, Romance, Arkansas, going to meet a girl, it's going to be great. You know, Romance. No. And I remember I did that. It was in November, it was in November of '95. I told you, November is a great month. And I, and I remember that's when the Lord called me to ministry, 28 years ago. And that might not mean much to a lot of people, but when you look at statistics and so many ministers are are leaving a month, in a year because just discouraged, and I was the one that th people thought, you're not going to make it long, and I'm still here. Why? Because I learned to put my life in God's hands. There may be people not crazy about how I do things, and that's fine, because I'm doing my best to do what God tells me to do. And he's taken me and my wife places that we never thought we'd be. Or we've done things that we never thought we would do. And it's all for the glory of God because I learned to trust God. Listen, young people, older people, everybody. Learn the one thing I could tell you besides giving your life to Jesus is you trust your life in his hands. You mess up. When you take matters in your own hands and you do what you want, learn to listen to God. That's why it's important to read the Word. I get tired of people saying, I just can't hear from God. The first thing I ask them is, how much have you read His Word? Well, not much. It's like, that's the primary thing that He does to talk to you. Learn to place your life in God's hands. And sometimes He's going to have you do stuff that makes absolutely no sense. But when you learn to put your life in his hands, that, my friends, is what it does. Thing. So like I said, it may not mean much to me, but every year I'm thankful because I'm going on 28 years of being in ministry. And when you would ask me when I was 18 years old, could I, would I ever see myself doing this? I would have said no. When you place your life in his hands, he will guide you into doing things you never, ever thought that you would ever do. Six, fifth, I mean, is I'm thankful that my spiritual family cares about me. I'm going to water it down. And it may not be a popular thing to say, but I'm going to say it. I'm thankful for church. Not only am I thankful for church, I'm thankful for this church. Let me say it again. I'm thankful for church. Because I learned when I was young that 
it's ultimately that it's church is God's gift to the church. I mean, God, it's one of God's gift to culture. We talk so much about how the world is going. You know something? The culture should not influence the church. It should be the church that influences culture. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for people in this church. I'm going to give you some reasons why. Because sometimes I think people view church as a burden. Just being transparent. Not a burden. When you view church the right way, church, the, what you view church as, because church is more than a building, it's the people in the church. It's his church. Just like Open Arms is part of the church, First Baptist is part of the church. Union Valley is part of the church. We're all his church. We're not competing against anybody. There's something wrong when we're competing. It's, we're not competing. We need to be cooperating, and that's what changes culture. I'm thankful for the church. They they didn't know uh, Charles and Jane Pruitt, and I see Myra. Can you guys stand? Myra Sullivan, is she here? I want you guys to stand. I want everybody to give them a round of applause. You can be seated. No, stay standing. I'm gonna stay standing. You might say, "Well, why are you why are you so thankful?" They're, they're, I'm thankful that they're part of this church. Here's the reason why. Because for so many years, I didn't have a family. The dorms would close here on Thanksgiving, and I had nowhere to go. And Charles and Jane would take me in, and we'd go to Myra's house. We'd have Thanksgiving. You might be saying, well, it's true. It's, they're, they're the church. I think of Cheryl Strayhorn, and and I used to be in their 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 uh, Sunday school class. And they, you know, those one year during Christmas, they invited me to be with their family for Christmas dinner because I had nowhere to go. But when the church steps up, and it becomes more than a building, and it's the people of a church, friends, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for church, and I'm thankful for this church. And if somebody sins, it's not something to be embarrassed about because the true church, we pick people up when they're down, we dust them off, we pat them on the back and say, go get them. I'm thankful for church. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful that this mission has always been a place where it hurts to heal new life to begin. And we're not perfect people, but it's a scary place when you look at the church and you criticize or you view it as a burden. And maybe you're in this room and you view church as a burden, and I want to speak to you and you say, you need to shake that off. Because when you let the church be the church, then that's what makes the difference. So I'm thankful for church. I'm thankful that my spiritual family cares. And then sixth, I am thankful that our problems are temporary. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. And so when I know that, I don't get discouraged. Yes, I fight, I struggle, but when I know that in all things God works for the good for those who love Him, I don't get discouraged because with each day that passes, we get one day closer to being with Jesus. I hear the news all the time. And I know I'm not screaming and shouting. I'm, I'm really sharing my heart with you. When I watch the news, I don't get discouraged. And you might be saying, you're crazy. Look at all the craziness. It's, it's just, it's, we've gone mad. And I think, yeah, things are crazy. But if my life is in his hands, and if we believe that Jesus is coming back, then why am I stressing over things? Because with each thing that happens is one day closer to, to Jesus coming back and we're gone. Whatever problems we face as families and as culture and as this world, we know that our problems are temporary. Because the blessed hope, and I hope this gets people excited, because one day Jesus is coming back to take his church. That's why I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, yes, it's crazy right now, but, oh, I have this hope. And I know that I know that I know churches used to sing about the coming of Jesus with, with joy and all that. 
Friends, it's still time to sing those songs because you look at the news and you know it's coming. He's coming. And even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm thankful that my future, my, that my problems are temporary. So guys, live a life that's thankful. Thankful. When you do that and you adopt that attitude of thanks living, friends, that is what you need. Maybe you're in this room. And worship team, please come on up. Maybe you're in this room. And you read these things and you can say, you know what, Pastor Dan, I haven't been thankful. You know, God took the time to share with us this morning about how we need to continue to praise Him. Maybe you're in this room. And I felt the Holy Spirit say this. Maybe you're in this room and you've been questioning things. You've been questioning. You've been struggling. And and who knows, may, maybe you're in here and you just you feel like you have to be here. Or maybe you're just in here and, and you've been struggling. And I'm here to tell you that God is still the same yesterday, today. And He lives His, li- His lifestyle to take care of you and love you. And He just wants you to live a lifestyle thanks living. So today, church, I'm just here to tell you I'm thankful. I'm thankful that He has chosen to choose me out of His Son. No matter how much I fail Him, no matter how much I've sinned against Him, and there's always room for me at His table, and I'm here to tell you as a church, there's room for you at the table. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand up. But this is what I want to do. I want to give you this invitation. But before I do, I want to read this to you. It's a poem goes through the alphabet in a way, but it's it's something that I have written on my computer because I never want to forget it. But it says this, Although things are not perfect because of trial or pain, continue in thanksgiving and do not begin to blame. Even while the times are hard, fierce winds are bound to blow. God is forever able. Hold on to what you know. Imagine life without His love. Joy would cease to be. Keep thanking Him for all things and love and parts to these. Move out of camp complaining. No weapon that is known on earth can yield the power praise can do alone. Quit looking at the future. Redeem the life at hand. Start every day with worship. To thank is a command. We, until we see Him coming, victorious in the sky. We can run the race with gratitude, exalting God most high. So friends, maybe you're in this room. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you don't. What a better time to get to know Him. Knowing Jesus is not going to church. Knowing Jesus is isn't saying you love God. Knowing Jesus is making a lifelong commitment to serving Jesus. And I promise you this, sometimes life will be a struggle, but you can still give thanks knowing that He cares about you and that He loves you and that you have abundant life. So before we go, before we go into a time of praise, I want to give you this opportunity. What a great day to be able to do it. What a great day. You can't beat this, friends. What a great way to start Thanksgiving. You can leave this place today giving thanks to God because He washed your sins away. So if you're in this room and you say, you know what, Pastor Dan, if eternity would have happened today, I'm stressed about because I don't know. I don't know if if I'm right. But today I want to get right with God. I want Him to, I want His Son Jesus to Jesus to forgive me of this sins, and I want to walk out of this place rejoicing and giving thanks. If that's you, I'm not going to beg you. I'm giving you the opportunity of a lifetime, an opportunity of eternal life.